and click it. Okay, it's probably okay. enough. <laughs> Are we going to be able to do it? Oops, we're doing the we're doing the pausing. Are we going to pause? There we go. We to do a little... Here we go. Okay, everyone. It is Sunday night, June Wait, 6th. Did we really do it? Yep, we did it. Do you guys see all the smooth transition we just did? It's not usually like that. <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, welcome to the Freedom Exchange. Um, we are here today with Lynn Espejo, and we're excited to hear from her. It's going to be um, get your rain gear on. It's going to be a fire hose of some yeah. amazing information. Uh, but we, I'm Allison. And this is Christy. Hey, everybody. Hello. And we are here because we are big about debunking the myths and the stigma and the misinformation that exists with people that have been in prison, people um, that have gone through this process of being sentenced, and all of the craziness that goes around that that is not what you would expect. Uh, if you're like me, and this is a newer arena for you, you don't know a lot of the stuff, and it's just it's shock and awe all the time for me when I learn, um, I learn vocabulary, I learn policies, I learn inconsistencies, I learn just so much that um, needs, I feel compelled that the masses need to hear about. So we bring on these amazing guests that have experienced it and have lived experienced and have been incarcerated. And it's, it's, it's interesting for me, it's super interesting, but it's also mind boggling and it makes you want to Frustrating. Make an uh, make a huge effort to change that stuff. So, um, Christy, you tell why are you here? Why are you on this show? Wow, I'm. I feel so lucky because we are meeting the best people. And with my experience of being in prison, I was in prison in 2013 to 2017. I had never been in trouble. I was shocked for probably the first <laughs> two years that I was in there. And um, like everyone that we talk to, you're so surprised of all the stuff that you see. You're watching inconsistencies and really criminal activity happen in the prisons, not by other prisoners. And you're just shocked. Like, am I really, am I really watching this? This is insane. And so um, now that I'm out and um, I graduated college, so I want to help other people learn that they can do a lot of stuff. And like we have Lynn on here who graduated college with her master's. And so um, we, I want people to know that no matter what they've been through, whether it's prison or, or something else, because we've all been in some sort of mental prison in our life, we want people to know that you can take that horrific time in your life and kick ass. And so Lynn is the person too that'll continue that um, conversation for us. So thanks you guys for being here. And welcome Lynn. Um, I, I have to tell you that I was um, taking in lots and lots of YouTube videos and reading lots and lots of stories from people and it didn't click with me until we spoke last time that something was familiar about your story and you were probably one of the very first stories I heard but it, I, when I was talking to you the other day on the phone, I was like, oh my gosh, it's her. <laughs> That's what she said. Oh, oh my, my gosh, gosh, I know this person. This is this, this incredible story. And now I'm sitting and we got to talk to you. And so it's really cool that you said yes. And you're here with us because I know you're super busy. I know you've got lots going on in your family right now. And it's just so good to have you here because what you have to share is, um, it blows my mind and I haven't stopped talking about it since we talked last. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, ladies. Yay. Um, I told you we're going to do it a little bit different this time because of your experience and because of how articulate you are and how many stories you have and examples. You're so good about sharing these things that we want everyone to hear. So we're going to do, our, uh, do it a little bit different with you. Um, but before we start, because um, this is something that I'm learning about, could you tell us the difference between home confinement I'm sorry, between um, going to prison and be going to camp, because that was part of your story. And then we'll move into your story. Well, the federal system has several security levels. So there's USP, which is, which is the penitentiary, which is a high level security. And those people are definitely behind the walls, as people say, behind the fence, locked in cells. I think they get out, you know, some, but not as much. And then you go to the next level, which is FCI, Federal Correctional Institute. And those, um, the Federal 
correctional institutes are run somewhat like a camp, however, not with the freedom. So there are there's still fences. There is still cell doors that shut. For instance, when I was um, at the Oklahoma Transfer Center, that would have been somewhere in between a USP and an FCI mm -hmm. because they hold all security levels there. A camp is a little bit less secure. Like for instance, you could have walked away whenever you wanted to. Um, Brian, where I was at, did have a fence up with some black tarp, but it was mainly to keep the neighbors, believe it or not, out of their property instead of us from leaving. So we could have still escaped, walked away, whatever you want to, you know, call it. And we did not have cell doors. We had four women to a room with bunk beds. And uh, so you had a bunkie. That's what we called the person that, you know, slept above or below us. And so you had two sets of bunk beds, four lockers, and a little bitty, less than a walk-in closet room. You had showers down the hall, bathrooms down the hall. Whereas in an FCI and a USP, you have a toilet in your room and a sink, like I had at Oklahoma, where if you have a roommate, you are forced to do your business right there out in the open with them there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's quite different. And some of the rooms uh, even have showers. Like in Oklahoma, when I was housed for quarantine, uh, right before I was released on the CARES Act, I was placed with another female in the men's max security shoe uh, for a 14 day quarantine and with men present in the adjacent cells. It was quite the experience. And um, we had that. a shower. That's crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. And we even had a shower in our cell because we were not allowed to leave. If you wanted them to open the door to get your trash, you had to back up to the door and be handcuffed. Mind you, I was community custody. I was a self-surrender to a camp. I had been on a social furlough with my husband even. So where that meant where I left the camp for 12 hours and reported back. But yet I was placed in the max security shoe for quarantine and treated like someone that was there under the same rules yeah. for the people that were there that were taken out of general population, meaning the rest of the prison population for your audience that may not know that term. Mm -hmm. And I was placed with people who were in the SHU for behavioral issues. Right. So, so those are the, the security levels that are in the federal system. Mind you, there's some private prisons and maybe a few other um, things. And then of course, you mentioned home confinement, Allison. That's what comes after prison to a halfway house. Um, however, I was released straight to home confinement. I was never at the halfway house, but I was monitored on an ankle monitor when I got out originally last year in May. Um, I was on an ankle monitor through the halfway house. Yeah. But there are there higher, the higher level security prisons are a lot rougher too. So a USP, a lot more goes on than a camp. And I can tell you, I saw the difference when I was at Oklahoma. Like yeah. I was shocked. I was locked behind a door. Um, at the time COVID hit, we were getting out 30 minutes every two days. Sometimes we went like a week. So that meant no shower. I was in a room by myself. So I was basically in solitary confinement, even mm -hmm. though I wasn't considered solitary. But I did see a lot of the differences in going to Oklahoma. You know, I flew on Con Air to get there, which was a wild experience. And, you know, just I saw the difference of what a camp versus a actual prison was yeah. really like. Yeah. So, Lynn, um, your story is so detailed and there's so much craziness about your story. And I know you've told it a million times. And like you said, we can find your story all over social or all over the internet, which is really cool because I encourage anybody that's watching this to go and watch some of those interviews with you and read some of the stuff in your blog, which we'll put in our show notes because you've got this great blog that's walked through this whole experience with you. But for tonight's purposes, can you give us the nutshell of um, why you ended up going to a camp? Well, I was accused of a crime I did not commit. And um, I was indicted. That indictment was dismissed. They, the government had seized money for my husband and I 
and I refused to give it up and I fought them for it. Two and a half years later, I had ticked them off so bad, to be honest, they came back and reindicted me. They wanted the money, I really believe is the ultimate uh, reason, but they did, the, the prosecutor that I had reported all the way to Washington for being dirty, came back, reindicted me, um, charged me three different ways that time. Um, I went to an eight day jury trial, did not succeed after you know seeing them vote everybody off the jury that would have understood my case. And because of me daring to go to trial, I missed out on their probation plea deal that I could have took, you know, on the front end. And I ended up getting sentenced to 45 months in prison. So, you know, that's it in a nutshell, basically. So, so what did you think when you heard the words from the judge, 45 months? Well, considering the government, after I was found guilty at trial, tried to get three enhancements yeah. that would have caused me to serve eight to 13 years in prison. Um, honestly, you know, the judge at sentencing, I had a lot of character reference letters uh, from people that have known me. You know, again, I was really not a criminal out there committing crimes. So I had a lot of people speak up on my behalf including my pastor and lots of people that, you know, were known to be good people in the community. And I had, um, I think 165 character reference letters were turned wow. into the judge. Wow. She, that's did, a lot. Did it, girl. she ended up giving me a two level variance oh. based on my character reference letters. So 45 months was just barely above the minimum. Once we got down to that variance, okay. did I, did, did I feel shocked at that moment? You know, I look back sometimes and think about that day. And honestly, I think I was so numb by then. And I was just so, all I could think about was keeping my legs from buckling yes. and standing mm -hmm. there, you know, cause you're standing up and all the people behind me, I could hear my husband start, you know, kind of sniffle and things. And, mm -hmm. and I know he did that the day I was found guilty too. I could hear him sniffing. And I just laid my head on the desk because I just I was just like uh, in disbelief. Mm -hmm. I think by this point you're just kind of numb. Yeah. My case originally started in um, March of 2011 when I went to my mailbox one day and had a letter that told me to report to pre-trial because I'd been indicted three days earlier. So I didn't get that sentenced gives me the till November. <laughs> Just to, I did not just get sentenced. That. <laughs> that's right. Scary. So that was 2011. That case was dismissed wow. in 12. I was reindicted in 14. I went to a jury trial in 17. I got sentenced at the end of 17, almost a year later. And I didn't go to prison until February of 18. So by the time November of 17 got here, I had been going through this for more than six years, almost seven. And was about. I knew I was going to prison soon. I think I was so numb at the time. I, honestly, 45 months really, uh, it, it, it was it was what it was. You know, I, I honestly was just numb. Yeah, no, I get Friend, that. Friend, this totally. has been a long journey for you and it's yeah. not over. So um, I want to do a little shock and awe right now. And I want the audience to um, get ready for a fire hose of crap. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> Fire hose of crap. Uh oh, that she, does not sound good to me at all. She's got it. <laughs> what kind of crap? <laughs> You're gonna hear it. Okay. So get ready, because Lynn is articulate, but she can talk. She can say a lot in a short period of time. Because I'm gonna give her. Oh, should we do a timer? Should we sure. make it fun like that? All right, I have a timer. You're gonna do yeah, it. I'll do it. Okay, we're gonna give. Um, a, I don't know, five, four or five minutes. And four or five minutes. Okay. Four or five. You pick. Okay. You pick. Um, for, for each. For each thing. And so when it goes off, we're going to switch gears. Cause okay. So how much time do we need? Four. Let's do four minutes. Okay. So as you get that ready. So what we're going to do is, Lynn, I want you to, as much as you can, go through on each topic the things you experienced, the things you witnessed, the, um, the fraud, the inconsistencies, the behavior of, the BOP, the COs, you know, we, we need talk. to change that to four hours. No, four minutes. I know that's, I mean, that's why on. we're playing a game and All it's called, four hours? it's called speed round, oh, shit. but she can do it. I know she can do it. Um, okay. Are we ready? All that for four minutes? Well, no, we're going to do a topic. Okay. Okay. Tell me. What, okay. Tell me so what. the first one I want you to talk about is, um, medical treatment of of the women and you know you know you i'm not even gonna four minutes for that right? four minutes for that just <laughs> okay. you tell all the stories go yeah 
All right, so medical was terrific at Bryan. Uh, we were treated by PAs. Uh, there was no doctor on staff. The doctor that they every now and then came in came from somewhere else. And at one point we had a doctor that was there briefly, but they said he had an ankle monitor on. So we're pretty sure he was also a, a federal uh, inmate. Um, I saw there was women that a woman that had died at Brian right before I got there. She had gotten the flu, which they allowed to turn into pneumonia because they forced her to go to the kitchen every day, regardless that she was very ill and older. She did pass away. I saw a woman that was having heart trouble and they told her to walk the fourth of a mile to medical. She had a heart attack on the way there. I saw a woman who had a hernia that was hanging down so big on her stomach. She looked like she had a baby hanging down. They let her go like that forever without surgery. I saw women that had hysterectomies and they were required to walk multiple times a day to medical to get pain meds and things right after coming back from a hysterectomy, major surgery, sleeping on a mat that looked like a kindergarten mat with no comfort. I can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I saw women that got cancer and would tell them things were hurting them and they, would, they wouldn't do anything. There was women that they would literally have to pass out in the unit. I mean, fall out before they could get medical help and they would go to the hospital in an ambulance and the doctors would be appalled at what BOP was not doing. I took in all my medical records. They would not accept them. So my husband went and got them and had them sent in. Part of my medical records was that um, I had been getting pre-cancer cells, skin cancer burned off and that I needed to see a dermatologist every six months. However, no matter how many times I showed the PAs, the stuff on my skin, I was never taken to the dermatologist in the 27 months I was in prison. I got out of prison in May of last year. By June, I was at the dermatologist. I was required to have five biopsies, two of which came back with two different kinds of skin cancer due to the neglect of the BOP. Um, I saw women that they took off their psych meds cold turkey. They would rarely give anybody anything for a depressive or anything, any kind of medicine. And these are women, some of them that had, you know, real psych issues. We would have to help them in the unit. We had a lady in our unit. She um, heard voices. It was obvious she was schizophrenic. She was talking to people that were not there. She thought she was married to Bob Marley. She thought her father-in-law was uh, Barry Manilow. She thought she talked to Michael Jackson, Biggie Small, Tupac pack, ever, pack every day. And she was very ill. And of course, other inmates that didn't understand mental health like I did would laugh. And you know, of course, it was funny to them. But she was very mentally ill. She was ripped out of the shower one day, taken out of there in the freezing cold with soaking wet because she didn't want males to do shower checks because mm -hmm. they were making male guard COs do shower checks on us. And she was telling them basically F off. I mean, she was cussing them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they basically handcuffed her, took her out with shower shoes, shorts, soaking wet. It was awful. I saw women that just, you know, no doctor treatment, nothing. Women were just, it didn't matter. They would always tell you, like, I got a really bad virus one time. I think it was food poisoning. And they were telling me I had to get up and go to work at 430 in the morning. And I told them, write me up, take me. They were telling me if I didn't go, they were going to shit me. I said, well, then shit me because I would get better treatment somewhere else besides here. So, you know, they were like pushing me in a chair. Okay. Okay. Sorry, that was good. Minutes. That was great. You delivered as I knew you would. <laughs> and can I say one thing in here? Because if someone's listening, they, they may think mm, that's crazy. Or that is like, it's hard to wrap your brain around, but I was at the FMC Carswell. And so I can say that every single thing you said, I can, uh, I, I can say that I saw the exact same thing, including cutting off the wrong leg of someone that leg had had to be amputated, what? a gal in RDAP who had cancer and they wanted us to give her help ups and, you know, do all the things you do in that drug program. And I said, I'm not comfortable with giving this lady, you know, a help up and she's, she's in pain. They said, lash over, it's, it's just gas. 
Mm. And she ended up dying two days later from a tumor. And then they all brought everybody in to say, now, what do you guys say about it? And we're thinking, I can't say anything. You're going to kick me out. And then I, and then I'll, and then I won't be able to go home okay. and it anyway. So anyway, yeah. And you were so, at a medical center. So think yeah. about when you were at the medical center. Okay. That's the only female medical center in the BOP system. So I wasn't even yeah. at a medical center. So for you to be experiencing those things at the medical center, that's yeah. even worse. I feel like. And they were all PAs and they also had ankle monitors on um, several like the kidney doctors, all that stuff too. And you were exactly right. I specifically had to fall on the floor in the bathroom. That was the only way that I could get medical treatment. I was begging the girls not to make me do that. And they're like, that's the only way you're going to get seen. And that's true. Crazy. It's true. So, okay. Okay. Set your timer. Thank you, Lynn. I can't stand Urgh. Urgh. Okay. Next one we're going to talk about, and it's a little too narrow. So I think I'll broaden it. I wanted you to talk about like food, dietary, and maybe it rolls into either, I don't know, commissary, but a little day in the life and just that kind of stuff. So set your timer. Okay. Go. This is good, Allison. Thanks. All right. So food at the BOP is if you think about the worst quality of food you can buy at the grocery store, then you're going to need to go down about 10 to 12 more notches. Okay. <laughs> and some of the boxes, because at Brian, we were all required to work in the kitchen when we first got there. So I saw for myself food that was being served to us expired. Like I got there in February of 18, the cereal had expired in 2014. Ah. We had chips that had, had expired in 2017, still being served. We had food, uh, boxes that clearly stated not for human consumption. Mm -hmm. We had weevils and bugs in oatmeal, That's cereal, true. beans, oh. and the, the, the staff would say too bad, cook it and serve it. Yeah. Oh. And so we had a lot of things like that. Uh, as far as uh, nutrition, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call any of that stuff nutritional, which forced most of us that could afford it to go by commissary, which was all preservative type yeah. items and try to make a meal like we made up, you know, prison meals. In fact, on my blog, I actually have some recipes that I told people to try at home, but <laughs> we had like meals that we made up and none of them were nutritious, but I mean, they tasted better than what we got in yeah. the chow hall. Sure, and sure. I will tell you something about the sandwich meat they fed us in sack yeah. lunches. I don't want to hear we it. had a pregnant yeah. cat and the pregnant cat was out on the track that we walked <laughs> and scared. someone took this meat. I, I mean, I literally blogged about this. You can read on my blog. Uh, it's what's, what's that meat is the name of the, the blog <laughs> post, but uh, someone took some of this meat out after I think the 4th of July holiday. Mind you, this is hot summer in Texas. Flies are everywhere. This cat is pregnant and starving. Not mm. either the flies nor the cat would touch that sandwich meat. Okay. It stayed oh, out there for it. days in a bowl. Oh. And I would walk by on the track and see it. And I'm like, I'm going to blog about that because <laughs> seriously, we called it mystery meat. But literally that's, that's when a, true, when a, a starving problem. pregnant cat and flies won't touch it. What does that tell you? And they're feeding it to humans, okay? Mm -hmm. So, oh, you know, the, so what is something else that I found that was really curious to me was when I was in Oklahoma, the food was even better there than Brian and people were saying how bad it was there. And in the men's shoe, remind, remember, these are men that are being punished. The food was 10 times better in the men's shoe than it was in the women's unit of the regular part of Oklahoma. So when people tell you that men are treated better in the system, that is not a farce. I saw it firsthand at Oklahoma. In fact, I had to write the staff up because they would leave our unit and go wait on the men and do things, let our food expire. The cart would have an expiration time. The food would be expired. So I started writing them up uh, for violating our rights. And then they started erasing the time off the placard on the cart. So I couldn't mm -hmm. see it. So I wrote them up for that. So, you know, they would leave us and, and leave us in a unit with people pushing emergency buzzards to take buzzers to take care of the men. Right. But um, a daily life at a camp, you had asked me to kind of elaborate on that. You know, you have a lot of free movement at a camp. You uh, have supposed classes you can take if you really want to call them that. There are, there is a college that would come in at Bryan and we had cosmetology classes and 
but most of the classes are inmate taught. Like I taught, taught a lot of classes my own self, like QuickBooks. I taught um, women classes on their value and worth and self-esteem and um, did, you know, like things like that, different little volunteer projects. But there are classes you can go take. You can walk around, you can walk the track. You do have to be locked down as they call it in your unit at certain times. But you do have like say, starting at breakfast till about 1030, you're, you're kind of moving around. And then you go back to the unit and you get called for lunch. And after lunch, you're either in class or you know some people don't work. They're walking the track, working out, whatever. And you have to be back at the unit at 330 to get ready for four o'clock count. Then you usually go back out about five uh, for, for dinner as your unit is called. And then you have to be back in, I wanna say it was 8.30 or 8.45, you had to be back in. So you could like go out and commingle with other women and you know talk to women that lived in different units mm -hmm. and take classes, go to the library, go, you know, there was a hobby craft they had, just things like that, that actually, you know, you had things you could do. But it the wasn't classes totally were, but the classes, like you said, were mainly taught from from other people in the prisons. Or I always joke and say that you know you could learn to crochet a bear, but there were no college or any any other yeah, class, like classes life like that. enriching. Yeah. Things. Okay, um, we could keep going, but I want to move to the next one because we have two more. Um, this one I know is close to your heart because I know what you're doing in your time now, but I would like you, you touched on it a little bit with some of the medical, but I want you to talk about the mental. Um, I don't even define it. I just will set the timer and I want you to start it. Start it. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you have so much to say on that. Okay. Go ahead. There's not really much to speak of in mental health for women at at the prison system. Um, there are some psychologists on staff. However, they're running the RDAP program and some other classes that they teach, uh, you know, life type programs that you can take. But as far as like, if you really needed individual counseling, you, you could go and talk to someone if you got to their open house, but they only took a couple of people at a time. So, you know, and they only did it once a week, maybe twice, I think once, but, there wasn't much to speak of for people that really needed mental health help. Um, I was I was within two classes of graduating with my master's in mental health counseling prior to self surrender, and so I was able because of that to help women that I would see suffering. Uh, I talked to women that had PTSD that suffered from you know, and the the way the COs would yell and and uh, treat us, it would actually set off or exasperate their, uh, their PTSD or anxiety or stress. There was women that had been abused, women that had had sexual abuse, physical abuse. And, you know, like I told you a minute ago, at one point, men, male guards were doing shower checks and those women were deathly scared. They were, they were horrified that a male was gonna come in. They felt very violated. And when a CO that was male would yell and, and talk to them very ugly, which, you know, all the guards talked to us very, very ugly. I mean, to the point of calling us names like yeah. Kachina, which is nasty, dirty pig, uh, yeah. cussing us, calling us effing, you know, the B word and things like that. They would get so scared and so it would just set their PTSD off. In fact, one lady would talk to me about it. She ended up transferring because she could not stay there the way she was treated. It was, it was just horrific. And so people that had uh, mental health issues, they, they just were not getting any treatment. Like I said, they took some of them cold turkey off their meds and there's only very few site meds that are approved. However, Bryan was not a medical center. So they sent us people there to the camp that really did belong at Carswell. But from what Christy's saying, they really wouldn't have got the help there either. Mm -hmm. However, they did not belong at a camp with those issues when the camp was not able to prescribe the correct meds. And this is not just at Brian, this is BOP wide. I've talked to many women that have been in the system and BOP wide people are taken off their meds, co-turkey meds, they may have been on for years. Yeah. And you know, not just psych meds, other meds. For instance, I was on Celebrex, which is a anti-inflammatory because I had a torn rotator cuff and I have some arthritis issues. They wouldn't let me have that. I'd been on it for 10 years or more. So, you know, but 
again, you can maybe live with that. You're going to be in pain, but when you're someone with a mental health issue and you're not getting your psych meds or things that you need to literally function, I mean, that really puts you at a setback and prevents you from, it may even make you have behavioral issues and get you, you know, shipped off the compound or get you sent to the shoe. So it's putting people at a disadvantage right off the bat that really do suffer from those issues. Okay. And at Carswell, uh, yeah, I mean, it's no, it's no different. It's no different there, there at all. I had a gal that I helped even write a slips to get some help because her father had been molesting her. And they said no services for that. That was, I saw it with my own eyes that they, they don't help for that at all. So there's, you know, there's no help. And, you know, I, I keep saying that all the time. They don't care. Anytime anyone says anything, I'm like, they don't care. They don't care. They about do the not family. care. They don't and care. everyone is treated the same. Yeah. There's no individualization for people with different issues. You're just all lumped into one big pot. And it really doesn't matter, you know, if you're innocent, guilty. At that point, I guess that really didn't matter anyway. But it doesn't matter how you carry yourself, how you act. You're still treated the same. Ever, there, are, there are staff that have their favorites. And those people are treated different, differently. Um, you know, but otherwise, you're pretty much just all lumped into one big lump of a number. And treated, mistreated. My ass, sorry, I gotta ask one question. Just real, real quick. So um, people would think, well, isn't there anybody in the prison that you could ask or tell them what's happening and how would they respond? Like a counselor or some, not, not counselor, um, mental counselor, but like your, you know, how they have staff or group counselors that I know don't do anything at all, at all. But what, what would you say to that? Is there anybody you can tell them what's happening, the way you're treated? No. They do not care. I wrote staff up for it. I tried to hold them accountable. Um, I would get really agitated when uh, we had staff that would uh, talk very ugly to gay, lesbian, transgender people. Uh, we'd call them it, those that identify as other. You can go outside, you know, and see your girlfriend now. Just treat them very ugly. And I wrote them up for that because that is actually um, a violation of, of BOP program statement 342011. Five little C. I know that one by heart because I used it so many times because that is employee, you know, uh, employee conduct. And so much of what is violated falls directly under that policy. And um, I wrote them up so much that and reported it to my state senator that when I was in Oklahoma, the SIS, uh, which is the security people, brought me an affidavit from the DOJ that started out the first paragraph, did you tell Senator Bozeman, blah, 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 and, it, and I signed it because it was about, you know, staff mistreating inmates, and I had written all that up, and, you know, of course, Brian, when you're at a camp and you're dealing with staff in an institution, they don't like each other. They talk bad about each other. They try to one up each other. However, when it comes to them or an inmate, they're going to, you know, protect their own. So even if they hate the other person, you know, their staff member, they're going to protect their own. Yeah. To your question, is there anyone you can really tell? Um, you can go to your case manager and tell them stuff and they're going to be like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Like, yeah. it's acceptable behavior. And so you know, nothing's going to happen. Um, I wrote so many administrative remedies that I was actually shocked when I was in Oklahoma and that affidavit came. But I did find out later that they say that that, that particular guard that that affidavit was on uh, quit. But it was shortly after I signed that affidavit. I don't know if they were putting pressure on him to quit or if he got mad because they were investigating him or if they even did anything. Maybe he just quit because he was going to quit. But um, I did, I did at least, you know, sign it and hopefully the DOJ investigated, but I honestly have no high hopes that they did. One, one last question that I'm going to let you um, do, but um, so first of all, SIS means, what does it mean? Um, Secu investigative uh, services. Uh, the first S is for Special investigative Yes, yeah, special investigative services. And they are, and then there's SIA. And oh. the SIS is supposed to investigate inmate uh, misconduct. And the SIA is supposed to be for administrative 
for staff. However, our SIS guy, our at Brian, he was just a good old buddy. He'd been one of our lieutenants. He was a good old buddy with the rest of them. I mean, he he called me up there one time about some of my write-ups and had a big old long conversation with me, but I knew he wasn't going to do anything. No. And, you know, I was thrown in the shoe several times at Brian for blogging. Uh, they did, They took great offense to my blog. And I so I wrote him up. I, I wrote him up for that. I was going to ask about I know one more the blog, but also the fact that I don't I I'm certain it wasn't just me. The majority of the people in Carswell would um, you would not really it would be you would it would have to be a huge deal to write someone up because your locker would get tossed, everyone in your room would get upset because then you're putting all of them at risk. So I would have loved to have you in my in my unit at Carswell because I, I had no idea that you could do what you did without getting um, without getting a bad consequences um, higher than what would be expected and for everybody else around you. So I, I mean, I did get my locker tossed a lot and I was thrown in the shoe. Like I said, several times they threatened to ship me. They would do things to me. They would mistreat me. Um, I was removed from Cosmo for refusing to sign fraudulent hour paperwork. And I fought and got back in the class because uh, by the time that we got around to three months down the road, not only was my senator involved, but I, I had made it my mission to write them up three times a day for all their violations. So <laughs> I, I would go to the law library and I told the warden I was gonna do this. I told her, you wanna remove me from cosmetology where I'm bored and have nothing to do, then I'm gonna go to the law library. I'm gonna find three things y'all are violating every day because the list is very long and I'm gonna write you up for it. And every time you retail, your staff retaliates on me, I'm going to write them up for that as well. So I would go and I would go learn the policy. Um, I would learn not only the BOP policy, but I learned the institution because there's several policies. There's one for the institution. There's one for the overall BOP. So if, if you don't have... If you don't have an institution policy, you have to follow the BOP. However, BOP policy says that institutions can make their own policy that's different, right? So you have to know both. At one point, they were so tired of me calling them on all that, they took the institution policy out of the library where I couldn't find it. And I had to write them up for that too and, and, and write them up for taking policy away because you can't do that. So I, I became known as the policy person at Bryan. Not only did I beat all the false shots they wrote on me, starting with blogging, they took great offense to uh, my blog. The, the first one they took offense to, I'd been blogging for like nine months just about my experience and my feelings. They didn't care about that. But the minute I wrote a blog that said corruption at the BOP, oh, I got, I was written up. And so, funny, I um, why. that's so weird. They're so. Sensitive. I know, I know. They didn't value my opinions. I don't think. I don't think they really valued my my freedom of speech or anything there. So, but anyway, um, I immediately was written up for that. I know. I'm wondering if we need to put and, a tracker on your butt now. Now that you're out, because it doesn't stop when you're out. Oh, she's got. So uh, I was written up, and I was called to the lieutenant's office, and I read it. I read the sh the shot incident report. Uh, uh, inmate term shots, what we called it. Uh, so I read it. It said that, you know, um, I had circumvented email. And I'm like, well, how did I circumvent email? Like, I'm, I have permission to talk to this person. And so he was like, well, I don't know. No, I just, I'm just serving you. So I go back and I, I, I get, you know, I go back and I get the policy and have my husband also to look the policy up and try to send me something. And so I make my list of questions for, I was supposed to go to what's the disciplinary hearing officer, better known as the HO. So I'm, you know, preparing, I guess, my case, you know, I get, I guess really fighting the, the, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in my district prepared me for this, maybe, I don't know, mm. um, you know, my case going on for so long, Yeah. but anyway, so I go and I get this policy, and I'm telling my husband on the phone, I don't think I violated this, and he's reading, he's like, I think you did, I said, how, they don't even have an email policy. This policy is for the U.S. mail, number one. It doesn't even say email. It says for, you know, U.S. mail. So first of all, I call BS on that. So I'm at number one, 
How did I violate an email policy when this policy is for US mail? Number two, what did I do to circumvent? Because I, I had pre-approved approval to talk to this person. If she's posting my blog on the internet, so she has every right to, and I can tell her to, because there's no BOP policy about social media blogging because they're so far in the backwoods and behind, yeah. okay? Yeah. And they don't even have an email policy, like I said. It was all phone or mail. So number three, every part of that policy, every sentence, I said, how did I do this? How did I do that? How did I do that? So I knew from, from policy, I'd be called to my case manager to, you know, sign some paperwork and be what they call teamed on this shot within five days. So she calls me, I go in there with my policy in hand and my little list of questions. And so I said, well, I'm, I need to ha and answered all these. And she's just like a deer in the headlights. Like no one's probably ever come in there to ask this. And she's like, uh, well, well I, I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that. I'm like, well, wait a minute, you're my case manager. Well, well, I'm not the one, I'm just here to let you sign this paperwork saying that I advised you of your rights. And I said, well, I'm gonna leave you a copy of this and I need DHO to answer this prior to me going because I'm gonna need witnesses called. I'm gonna, you know, I, I want to have a staff advisor and I gave him the name and her eyes got real big because it's one that nobody liked, the other staff didn't like. And I said, he's gonna be my staff representative. And she said, well, well, I don't think you can do that. And so I just whipped out the policy. Yes, policy such and such says da 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 da. I just verbatim started reading it. Girl, I needed you. Where where have you been all my life? Well, you should have came to Oklahoma when I was there. I guess we could have met. But anyway, yeah, so she wow. she's just like freaking out, telling me, you know, she doesn't know what to say to all this. I said, well, I need the answer to this because I'm going to put on a defense to this because I I'm not guilty of it. You can't take away my freedom of speech. And I said, and by the way. When you ask Region for the answer to these questions, be sure to tell them and let them know that if I'm found guilty of this, I'm going to appeal it all the way to Washington. And I'm also going to, once Washington uh, doesn't do anything about it at the BOP there, I'm going to sue and I'm going to sue you for violation of my First Amendment rights to free speech. And then I'm also going to name each and every staff member that participates in this in what's called a Bivens, meaning I'm able to sue you personally as an employee of the federal government for violating my civil rights. And I said, so be sure to let them know. And so I marched back up to my room. Woo! And 20 minutes later, she's calling me down there, you know, Spejo, report back to Ms. Stafford's office. Spejo, report back ASAP to Ms. Stafford's office. So I go down there and she goes, well, I've got some good news. Yeah. Um, that that shot has been a sponge. There'll be no record of it. I was like, well, I want a copy of everything I signed. Yeah. And she's like, oh, no, I, I can't give you that. I had to shred it. I said, no, I signed it. I get a copy. Well, they never would give it to me, but I had a copy of the shot. Tried to mail it out of there three times to my husband. Never could. Finally snuck it in a book, in a box of books I mailed home. Uh, and I always made sure I kept a copy of everything there. I had like a little arsenal in my education locker of policy. Wow. Like when I found something good to help me or someone else, I'd print it. And I have, I have like a stack this big at home right now because I brought it home with me and I'd still go back and find it. And, you know, but anyway, that shot was thrown out. So immediately they wrote two other ones on me, one of them for going to the bathroom in education. And I forget the other one, just a staff member just made some junk up and lied and said I was threatening her because I was going to, told her the threat was I was going to write admin remedy on her, which I did tell her that, but that's not a threat because that's my right, you know, to do it. So um, I immediately beat those as well. I got one of those uh, thrown out on a technicality because they made the poor little uh, compound officer who never saw me in education going to the bathroom come and sign it. And so that was technically faulty. So I had that one thrown out because it violated policy. And then the other one, um, I it was going to be DHO again. And so they sent it to region. And along with my list of questions that I came up with again on, you know, like, basically, this is fraudulent behavior by a staff member lying. And so I want the camera preserved in that area. I want all this stuff. You know, I want, I want film. I want it all. Well, they came back and said they were just going to dismiss it. If they wanted to write me up again, it was going to have to be for insolence, which was basically back talking. Well, I never heard another word. It just went away. So I beat all their shots. And then I started helping other inmates beat their shots. 
And so um, I was really a staff favorite by that point for sure. I love that, Lynn. I love- um, You don't mess around, do you? No, I just, I, love it. I just think about not even prison related, but just who you must be to advocate for yourself like that and not put up with anybody's BS just to follow status quo and keep your head down and do the time and that whole thing. It, it blows my mind that, so my, my next fear. question for yeah. you is really, can you, this is a little bit of a, but could you tell us as like a 10 year old little girl, what were you like in your home, at school, in your friend group? You know, I was always popular, well liked by my peers. Um, I was always loyal, honest, a good friend, um, went to church, believed in God, uh, always someone that people would come to talk to. I guess I was always a counselor and not really even knowing I was going to be you were that young. When you were that young, were you already presenting that way? I was always the friend that people would come to wanting help with things for some reason. I, you know, I can't, I don't know if it really goes all the way back to 10, but I can remember all through junior high, high school, college, and on into my adult life. I've always been the friend that people come to with their problems and I was I was that person at Bryan at prison too the women I served time with a lot of women came to me for help with things because you know they knew um, I would help them I still get calls to this day and I help women in fact um, the other day I actually got um, a text back from a lady that said I was an MVP because I actually did what I told her I would do to help her and got her some information and you know, I think a lot of times people aren't used to people maybe keeping their word on that. But I was also a feisty girl, I think. Like, um, I remember, like, I want to say second, third, fourth grade, uh, a little boy was pulling my hair and um, I saw him. <laughs> and I remember one time um, another guy, little, you know, the, we were just elementary age. He was like, stomping on my foot or something I punched him and it knocked his glasses off so I was always a little feisty I think um and I've always been fairly outspoken but I think the older I have gotten the more outspoken I've become and I will tell you this experience has definitely definitely made me very outspoken yeah uh, you know when I was back and I know we haven't gotten to this in 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 this conversation but um you know, I came home last year in May uh, from the CARES Act. I wrote Oklahoma up. I was only one of three women that got out of there. They were letting tons of men out, but they were not processing any of the women. And a woman had a lawyer and another one got granted compassionate release by the judge because she already had that pending. It didn't have anything to do with COVID. It had to do with, um, she had a family member caring for small children. And that family member, I think, either died, got cancer, something bad happened. And so she had won that and they were, she got released on that. And like I said, the other lady had um, a lawyer involved because she had gotten a sentence reduction, but she had gotten stuck at Carswell because COVID locked her down there on her way back or rather Oklahoma. She was on her way back to Carswell to get out because she had been to court and, you know, you have to go through the transfer center the marshals are transporting you to court and stuff. So we were one of only three that got out there. I got out because I wrote a BP-8 on them. I wrote them up for not processing women and told them I qualified for the CARES Act and that I wanted to be processed to home confinement. Uh, not even but two or three days later, they brought me the paperwork. And so um, <laughs> whenever, you know, so I, I, you know, I told the other women there, look, go write them up. But, you know, unfortunately people just didn't, but um, well, I fear. did. It's fear. I wrote them up one fear. day for not giving us blankets. I'd been there six weeks and hadn't even had a blanket. Oh, we got those blankets immediately. Yeah, I wrote them up for letting the buzzer go off um, in the unit. And one time I actually timed it and wrote it exactly up. And I also quoted the Epstein case and said, do you want to get indicted for neglect of your duties? And, you know, I was really, I let, wrote them up pretty hard on that. Wow. And wow. so I wrote them up. I told you for the food and all, you know, that, yeah. but anyway, I was released last year, uh, on the CARES Act in May. And I came home straight to home confinement through the halfway house on an ankle monitor. And as you know, um, I continued blogging. I continued speaking out, doing my own radio show, 
uh, you know, talking against the BOP, even though I was still under the BOP. Well, in January of this year, they had told me um, after Piper Kerman had tweeted one of my blog posts and it went viral, Piper Kerman of Orange is the New Black. Well, they took great offense to that. And they, they told me I had to shut up. Um, and, you know, so I started quoting policy to him again, like, you can't, you can't do that. Like, I've already been down this road with you. And so, you know, you're violating my rights, but I won't do my radio show tonight until y'all get this straight. However, I'm going to have Larry Levine go on there and he's going to tell my listening audience why I'm not on there, that y'all are basically violating my rights. Well, that was on a Friday. By Tuesday, I was called and told to report to the halfway house. I was being violated from the CARES Act that uh, I would report they were going to cut the monitor off and the U.S. Marshal would take me back to prison. So I had, I did what they said. I called my husband. I reported back and um, I was taken out to the Pulaski County Detention Center here in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And it's a really nasty, terrible place that makes federal prison look like um, a five-star hotel. And uh, they didn't even have a light in the shower because you didn't, they didn't want you to know. I mean, if the showers at Brian were bad enough with black mold, black worms crawling out of the drain, well, I don't even know what was in the shower at the county because they didn't want you to see it. But I do know one time I accidentally touched the wall and it was so slimy that I just was like, ah. Uh, but again, by this time, I'm numb because I've already been through 27 months in the feds and flew con air and been locked up at Oklahoma. So, you know, I didn't even cry when they took me back. I was shocked. Like I, I you know, but um, they were violating people so bad out there, their rights, uh, the mental talk about mental health, the way they treated mental health patients out there. It was horrific. They were placing women in rubber rooms naked, saying that they were suicidal. Uh, not trying to be too graphic, but there was a woman on her monthly cycle and she did not have anything for that and she's naked. So you can imagine what's going on there. Um, you know, people, there was one girl, she was there. She was very, obviously very off in the head. They had her strapped from her neck to her feet with what looked like a dog leash. And she was running around naked at one point, got away from him. Male guards slamming her in the floor. I've never seen, they had her strapped in a chair at one point. It was, it was so horrific that it just, my anxiety went way up. However, um, I spent my time reading a tablet out there to learn their policy. And on the 14th day, I had learned enough policy that the following day, as soon as I got that tablet, I was going to write up the county. I was already going to write agreements on them. I'm like, yeah, you're not going to be treating women like this. It's to write you up. Uh, we had not had one change of clothes. Like I got one change of clothes the whole 14 days I was out there. We had to sleep in them, wear them. If we clean anything in them, uh, they gave us no underwear, no bra, no socks. It was freezing cold. The blankets looked like they were pieces of blanket. It was horrible. And so um, I had decided I was writing them up on the 15th day as soon as I got my turn on the tablet because you had to use it to write them up. Well, God must have knew. I just, he just couldn't let me go down that road again because I got out the morning of the 15th because what uh, the BOP didn't realize was, was that I had a compassionate release motion pending before the court that I wanted to get off the ankle monitor and had, was asking him to go straight to supervised release because I needed to do my last internship to graduate with my master's. And it was going to be very hard to do that wearing a big fat ankle monitor that you can't even cover up. And I, you know, who's going to want me to be counseling them, you know, be a patient of mine and I'm wearing a big fat ankle monitor. So I had called, and, and also I was having a lot of PTSD and anxiety and I knew I needed help for it. And I had been asking the BOP and I had proven to the court with written documentation that I had been asking the halfway house to get me this, this counseling and the BOP wasn't providing it. So on the 14th day, the judge ended up granting my compassionate release, my pro se motion, and she gave them till the following day to let me go. However, you know, when I was out there, I, I said, okay, God, here we go again. Like, I guess this is your plan again. Here we are. We're on another journey. You know, what is it you need me to see this time? Because, you know, I feel like because I know I didn't commit this crime, there has to be 
a reason for me on this journey. And so I was ready for it. I was like, I'd already figured up what's the worst they could do to me under policy. I thought they would probably take 30 good days, meaning my out date would change from May the 4th to June the 3rd. So I would have just now been out. Um, they would have took me probably to back to Oklahoma, then rerouted me to Aliceville, which is where I was headed when I got stuck at Oklahoma. Um, after Brian was kind enough to ship me for blogging and reporting their pre violations. That's how yeah. I ended up at Oklahoma. But yeah. anyway, um, yeah. I think God just didn't want me to start taking on the county, apparently, because he let me out on the 15th day. Amazing. You, um, we only have like minutes left and I'm really bummed because there was stuff we didn't talk about, but I, I want to, you kind of ended on a good note there, but I, I think there's a little bit more I want you to add to just a, for a few minutes before we finish is um, we talk about PTSD and how you didn't have that going in, but you came out with some new fun um, situations, what would the word be, phrase, some new um, mental health issues. Um, Absolutely. That you didn't have going in. So whatever, we don't want to call this a rehabilitation or a correctional facility because that is not what ha what's happening. But we briefly talked about this and I know you did a little research. So I want to give you like a couple minutes because we have to finish. But to talk okay. about the, we have PTSD, but we also have post-traumatic growth. And I have been through some trauma in the last few years. Christy has shared her trauma of going to prison and way more that's happened than that but um and you have had this traumatic experience but it doesn't all mean bad it it produces something new in us if we let it if we let it not everyone does the people that we have on this show have chosen to take their experience and do something good with it and run with it whether it's advocacy changing behavior um reconnecting with important relationships and that's who we've been talking to because they're so inspiring and it's super important to my heart and to Christie's to expose all the crap that's going on. But more than that is, than is that. the resilience and the beauty and the creativity and the strength that comes from people that decide to take this experience and see the beauty in it and the strength in it and all the resilience that they got out of it. So I know you did a little bit of, um, you put some time to thinking about that post-traumatic growth. So in like, if you can do it in two minutes, that would be great. But I wanna hear your well, thoughts. First of all, let's define that post-traumatic stress syndrome is what people get after they've been under traumatic experiences. Um, you know, they can have triggers that cause them to relive those experiences. They may have what's called a uh, fight, flight or freeze, meaning some people are gonna stand up and fight during the post-traumatic. Some people are going to, to um, you know, run away, flee, uh, you know, and then some people freeze, they can't do anything. They're just frozen in place, okay? Um, then there are extreme cases of prolonged, uh, repeated uh, traumatization where there's really no chance to escape, kind of like prison, like you can't go anywhere. You just have uh, trauma over trauma over trauma, which creates, um, you know, a CP, CPTSD, and that is basically chronic PTSD, okay? And I think I had that when I first came home because I couldn't even function to pick out a lotion in Walmart. Like I couldn't, I couldn't stand to be around people at first. Like I felt like my house was too big for me to live in. My shower was too big. I, I just couldn't function. Like I was so traumatized from what I went through at Oklahoma. I do believe that I really had that. Then comes later uh, a term called PTG, which is, you know, the growth that comes, post-traumatic growth. And it's a term that uh, psychologists use to describe the positive change that occurs in an individual after they've experienced a highly stressful life event or trauma. Mm -hmm. And it refers to the idea that suffering does not have to dehabilitate a person. You know, like, kind of like what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? And in essence, um, you know, it, it's, it's talking about the growth that comes after you experience that and you do become stronger. So, you know, it, it's a power to shake um, things that have been entrenched in our beliefs and you have to start believing a different way when you confront the trauma. The traumatic event is there, but you learn to, you know, powerfully shift it to a different 
um, arena in your mind and use it in a different way. Uh, two thirds of all trauma survivors will experience T uh, PTG, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, women experience it more than men. Men, women experience it more than men. Some people call it resilience and it is kind of like resilience, but it's actually a result of the struggle with the trauma that um, helps you to grow in that, you know, endure that psychological struggle and you do kind of become stronger, but it's not because you're resilient. It's because again, you learn to refocus the way you look at things. Mm -hmm. you, you change your outlook, you change your entrance entrenched values and beliefs like I no longer believe in our our justice system but I used to believe in it okay so that's kind of a change that's come you know with mine um less resilient people may go through the distress and confusion of PTSD but more than likely they're not going to get the, the PTG because they're not as resilient as the people that overcome um when they're rocked to their core and, and by those events, and then they come out with basically new belief systems. Like I now believe we need to dismantle what is our justice system and redo it because it's so crooked. Yeah. So those are, you know, my worldview has changed in, in that arena. And honestly, in many other arenas, yes. my worldview has yeah. changed about how I see people who commit crimes mm -hmm. because I served time with some amazing women yeah. that made mistakes, okay? Yeah. So I have a different worldview of those types of people now than I had going in as someone who was innocent and thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to live with a bunch of criminals. And yeah. that's just not the truth. These are great women that made mistakes. And I will tell you, my Brian sisterhood, those women, I still keep in contact with those women on a regular basis. And they're some of the best women that yeah. I know and I've yeah. met. And I'm gonna say hi, cause I know they're watching and yeah. I love them. And, then and they're, they're a great group. Yeah. And so, you know, like I said, and, and really, I think I may have had a level of PTG even before I went to prison, because this is something I'll share right fast with you in a blog post that I wrote back in uh, February of 13 of 2018. It was just two days shot of, of two weeks before I self surrendered to prison. I blogged this. I fully believe that God allows adversity, anguish, and heartache to be valuable lessons in our lives. These trials and tribulations uh, bring us to a higher level of insight and understanding about who we are as a person. It can bring about changes in our own behavior and our perception of views of the world in which we live. Most importantly, the adversaries of life change our perception regarding our relationship with him, meaning God. And it can teach us to trust him even more. And I know I did when I went through this. First Peter 5.10 tells us, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will him, himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And I wrote that before That's prison. Cool. And it's so true today. Oh, I love it. That was almost like the you before sending you encouragement and trust for the you after you know it's like what a beautiful beautiful and sending you in with the arsenal of yeah. guts yeah for lack of a better word like, yeah you know I do believe that I was already well into this journey before I went in yeah. like I said I had a lot of years of going through the system, fighting it, trying to prove my innocence, being found guilty, just the whole trauma of that entire from 2011 to 18. It was almost like when I self surrendered to prison, it was almost a relief because it's like, okay, let's just get this over with at this yeah, point. Yes, yeah. Well, and now you can be available to help other women. I, I'm certain that there's, if any family members are listening, they're probably like, get that late ladies number because when you're in there, you're cut off from everybody mm -hmm. except for the few people that survive right in and you, you know fear fear is the biggest fear is so huge in there to make a mistake because you're so powerless anyway mm -hmm. you have maybe a few tiny tiny mm -hmm. things that keep you 
like whole and grounded and then for someone to rip that away what is yeah. fear is is really but there's a lot of the fear of going what you don't know is I think worse than when you get there you know and I tell women that that reach out to me now I'm like don't be scared you're gonna make it through it you know I had women I had people that found my blog literally and wrote me in prison and, oh, and I helped them from behind the walls with their journey on the outside as they went through their process of getting found know. guilty. Uh, mm -hmm. One lady was going to trial. She had lost. She found my blog. Uh, I still speak to her to this day. She's serving time now for a crime she didn't commit. Mm -hmm. So I think um, God does use these adversities to make us uh, it's his it's his path, not ours. We mm -hmm. like to think that our life is our journey, but but it's in not, reality. Yeah. It's God's journey. We're just on it and we get yeah. off of it sometimes, but you know, it is, it is his will, his path. Um, she's going to, Chrissy's going to check out our live feed and just see what's going on over there. Right. Because we need to go. Um, um, otherwise people get cranky at us. And I'm, well, I'm, and, and then I'm just going to say, say some comments um, from Mary just said that it was a sim similar situation at Alderson, which we can imagine they're all the same. Um, and the BOP doc doctors there have ankle leg bracelets on as well. People would not imagine that. I, when I first saw it, I thought that can't be true, but it is. We used um, to say, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. That's, what, that's our word. You can't make this stuff up. And they said that it, Anderson that they would hide the policies so you couldn't which when I saw the, the law library it was just this it was a computer that was archaic and not and 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 I am smart enough and I wasn't able to get in there so yeah so so they don't want you to know that sorry okay keep going um, what am I doing okay Linda and make it where you can't search it and find anything anyway you have to really get good at it exactly right um let's see Linda says Thankfully, Lynn has never been shy about standing her ground or speaking her mind since she spoke her first words at three months of oh. age. Oh, now we know. Oh, we're going keep back telling us things, Linda. Months. Keep telling us things. And Sparky Lee says, Hi, Lynn. And she says, I'd be lucky to be able to sound out those first three words. Um, let's see, what else do I have? And they say, You've always been a handful since day one. Ooh, someone's telling on you. Wow, that's kind of exciting. That's my mother, probably. <laughs> about your mother <laughs> let's see and someone else says i went to jail and at the feds with no charges had to stay at a halfway house with no charges had to wear an ankle monitor um, for almost two years with no charges the judge wow. made my attorney report to the prosecutor rather than her and still never let me see crazy yeah, yeah. broken system no charges People broken system that. You have done totally what my thought was for this for this particular conversation tonight was to say all expose bring awareness show the truth and it's you both have experienced that every, a million people could probably write in and tell us they've experienced those things worse things terrible just this is what this is for this platform is not just to to show the awesome resilience and strength and perspective shifting um, experiences that we all have through trauma, but it's it's to say this is not okay. These things are yeah. not okay, and we encourage people to, if any, at the very least, we encourage this platform to shift people's perspective of what they didn't know, and maybe when it comes time to voting or how they speak about. I'm sorry, I'm gonna do one thing. Stop, daughter. You're being very loud. I'm daughter. sad that we didn't get into the fraud I saw, the staff fraud, the waste well, of taxpayer dollars. People should read my blog because I did blog about that. And you, yeah. if you, when you go to vote, think about those issues because there's a lot of waste, a lot of fraud. Um, I mean, I used to say, oh who's the criminal? The people serving time or the staff? It's it's unbelievable the amount of fraud staff are committing that yeah. work for the BOP. Yes, I mean, and in fact, I think we can do another episode because that can be a whole hour of fraud. And also one last thing I want to say, I always want to say one last thing. Um, this is also to destigmatize people, um, the fact that, that there's people in prison. Most people, of course, before I went, I thought, people in prison are bad, you know, but actually, um, 
I want people to know what kind of people are in prison, how smart they are, how much trauma they have, what they have to endure. And, and people will say, even though you were in prison, then um, all these things happen, then you shouldn't have committed the crime. And then you wouldn't have to worry about any of that. That's like the flip answer to everyone. But um, I want people to know that, you know, being humane is is one thing if something were to happen to your daughter or sister yeah. wrongfully you would convicted want that too. yes yes and the fact that um i would just encourage people to ask questions don't be flip about what you think ask questions listen to these consistencies mm -hmm. of what what kinds of things happen in prison yeah. so we're not making society better by locking up first time nonviolent offenders. I will say that there, yeah. there needs to be community programming for those people. Yeah. There needs to be um, drug rehab for drug addicts. We're not helping them by locking them up. So I'll just leave your audience with that thought too, that society is not served better. Um, in fact, it is proven statistically that crimes that do not go down. We, we are locking up now, and I, may, I, I told the statistic in a, a video I did the other day, but we have locked up more drug addicts and drug offenders in the last 30 to 40 years than ever before, and the, the actual drug crime rate has not changed. It's not gone down. Yeah. So we're not helping society. We're, in fact, I would say we're making society worse because these people are gonna most likely, most people in prison are gonna come back and be your neighbor, your coworker, you know, someone in your community. Mm -hmm. And if you're bringing them back worse off than they left with mental health issues, you have actually, uh, you know, you broke a family up to send them there. I saw kids clinging to their moms, you know, you're scarring children. Um, talk to any child that's had a parent in jail, they've got scars from it. It's a, you know, it creates a pattern, a circular pattern. And we definitely, hours. you know, we need to look at how is this benefiting society because we lock up more people than any other country yeah. per capita. So there's it's, it's not so right. Much. And that's, and your efforts, our efforts, there's so many efforts going on right now. And that's, we just, that's, we'll put it in our show notes. We'll put some things in there for people to go resource if they want to read more and see more, but this is our little contribution to hopefully making a shift in all of this. So Lynn, thank you. I have one more. You. you are kidding me. <laughs> this is important. Okay, I want oh, everyone- All the other stuff no, is not. it's very important. But so, okay. So I have a message from somebody that says the feds need more fearless women like her that are not scared of consequences. I love people that go hard and say, fuck the feds. So there you go. Hey, oh, well, okay. Uh, I saw some women that had that tattoo actually when I was in prison. There were some people that had that as a tattoo. Um, so I don't plan on getting any tattoos, but but uh, okay, well, thank you. Thanks, ladies, for having me on. Uh, and, thank you, Lynn. Okay, we'll talk to you. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, it takes a village and it takes yeah. all of our voices. I encourage the other people that are sitting out there on the other side of this video to know you too can speak out. You too can be a voice. Don't be afraid. Speak up, stand up, let the public know. And, yeah. you know, we'll be here cheering you on. Come be on yeah. my show too. I'll have you on yes. there. If you have Freedom of speech, baby. First Amendment rights. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Lynn. Have Thank a super you. great night. I appreciate you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ladies. Good night.